Hey there, uh, I hope you're doing really well. And uh, this is gonna be the last episode for 2019. I'm leaving uh, tomorrow for a uh, two weeks vacation and yeah, uh, early early next year I'll be back here, of course. And uh, before we start here, I wanna say thank you to everyone that's left comments, that's, uh, you know, hit the like button, that's uh, uh, sent emails. It's been an amazing year. I've, I've interacted with so many people we've had a bunch of success stories we've learned a lot of things um i believe so um yeah thanks so much for this year hope you'll have a fantastic end of the year and a great 2020 and again i'll be back uh, uh early 2020 so that said um we do have a couple of really good questions uh, i think there are four emails there's definitely uh somebody named glennis i believe it was uh, asking some kind of specific CBTI questions. We have a follow-up question from Stacy, wondering like, how is it that people can kind of go on with this little sleep? Uh, we can talk about this question from Vince and Scott also. Scott was asking for some examples of people that have gone on to get past long-standing insomnia. I'm looking for maybe some inspiration there and, uh, and a, a bit more. So uh, with that said, uh, as always, nothing is medical advice. You just general thoughts and comments. I hope will be helpful to anyone tuning in. And I, let's start with actually um, this one here. Uh, this is a question that came in just uh, 16 hours ago. It's from Glynis. And let's read. Hi, Daniel. I have completed Martin Reed's free sleep training course, and I'm implementing the techniques. I have a couple of questions that I would like you to answer, please. If I wake up before my sleep window is up, say three quarters of an hour, and I'm still feeling sleepy and relaxed, can I lie in bed until my sleep window is up? We should get out of bed after half an hour. Uh, so uh, the question here is: um, so for those of you who haven't who who haven't heard of a sleep window, it's it's a kind of the most basic basic, but also the most the most commonly used, the most effective, I think, uh, technique for getting past insomnia, which is you decide upon a a, a window uh, of certain number a number of hours during which all your sleep should be. Um, uh, you know, you should not sleep with outside of that window. So I always use the same example, which is, let's say you, you get up 6 a.m. And, and you don't go to bed before um, midnight. First window. So Glenn here is asking, what if I wake up, let's say, uh, quarter past five, there's 45 minutes left on my sleep window, I'm feeling sleepy and relaxed, can I lie in bed uh, or should I get out of bed? I think definitely the former. Um, if you are... In bed, like what you want to avoid, what you want to avoid is frustration in bed, uh, associating the bed with being frustrated, but associating the bed with com being comfortable and, and feeling relaxed, perfectly fine. I think it's good, it's good actually. So I think that's a kind of an easy, easy question there. I think you should just stay in bed. And now let's keep reading. I've, I found also that keeping is, oh, why would I want to add this one, which I thought was important. Uh, if I wake up before my sleep, when I say three quarters of an hour, when I read that, my, my mind goes a little bit like, a little bit of red flag there. Meaning, uh, when somebody knows the time that specifically, three quarters of an hour, that to me signals that this person is um, kind of checking the time and monitoring time and uh, is aware of what time it is, which is not a good strategy. You know, generally speaking, I think it's much better not to know what time it is. I think it's much better to just have a have an alarm set for your uh, for when your sleep window ends and make it a point of not knowing what the time it is overnight. Because whenever you look at a clock overnight and you, it, it's just like, you know, even if it's just like, I, sometimes people tell me, well, it just, it's just a glance. I don't really look at the time. I just, well, then you still know what, what time it is. As soon as you know what time it is, you can't help but start calculating. Like I slept this much, this is good, this is bad. This, I have this much to do. And very rarely, very rarely is it, is it, kind of very rarely do you wake up in the middle of the night and look at the time and feel like, oh, great. It's almost always frustrating and, and kind of anxiety provoking. So I think it's really good to be timeless overnight. Now, let's keep reading. I found also that keeping a sleep diary with all the boxes that have to be filled in actually seems to be quite stressful for me because I have to think too much to try and remember how long I slept and how long I was awake. I find then that I'm thinking too much about sleeping, which is what I shouldn't be doing, according to the videos of yours that I watched. Is there a simpler way of keeping a sleep diary 
so that I can keep track of my sleep efficiency and see what progress I'm making. Great question. I love this very practical question. And, um, and just kind of reading it, Elenis, I feel like when I read a question like this, I, I have a sense that you're going to do really, really well. Uh, I think you're going to do really, really well. So now um, uh, I want to say this. First of all, a great observation, a sleep diary. A lot of these sleep diaries out there have all kinds of things. They're like, what time do you go to bed? How long do you take to fall asleep? How long do you stay asleep? What time do you wake up? How long do you wake up? Which is not helpful at all. You can, Exactly like you said, you want to move away from that. You want to get to a point where, you know, like somebody that doesn't doesn't have problems sleeping is at, which is they don't know how much they slept. They just go to bed, fall asleep, and get up. You know, like they, they don't really know what time it is, et cetera, and how much they slept. Now, in the process of getting there, I do believe that in the beginning, it is good to have a sleep diary kind of for accountability. And it kind of just gives you a sense that you're working on something, that you're doing something. So I feel like at least for the first, you know, one, two, three weeks or something like that, it's good to keep, to keep a sleep diary. As soon as you start feeling like, okay, I'm having some more sleep confidence, I think I'm doing better. As soon as you feel kind of ready, you can stop using sleep diary. You can still kind of uh, use that sleep window, but stop using that sleep diary. That's a good way to fade out. But now that said, um, uh, is there an easy way of doing it? I can tell you what I do in clinic. In, in clinic, what I do is like I see patients for, for the first time, and then I give them a sleep diary, which has like, it has six items, which is like, what time did you go to bed? Um, what time did you get up? How much do you think you slept? Uh, how many times did you wake up? Did you do an exercise today? So that the first part you put in the morning, and then the second part was just, did you do an exercise today? And how did you feel today? Those are kind of six things I track. And and I think I think that works really well. And by the way, you're asking here, is there a simpler way to keep sleep or so I can track my sleep efficiency? For those of you who don't know what sleep efficiency is like, how much of the time you're in bed that you actually slept. So if you spent eight hours in bed, you slept four, your sleep efficiency is 50%. And in kind of traditional CBTI, if your sleep efficiency is like less than 85%, you want to spend less time in bed. If it's more, you want to spend more time in bed. I honestly have started believing that it, you don't really need to do that. You can just go by, you know, your feeling. Like if you feel like you can look at your diary and kind of, um, kind of eyeball your sleep efficiency, or you can just go by. If most of the time I'm in my bed and I'm feeling good, well, that's perfect. If I sleep most of the time I'm in my bed, but I feel tired, then you may need to spend more time, but you can widen the sleep window. If you are um, uh, finding that you're still kind of struggling a lot, you're spending a lot of time awake in bed, then you may need to narrow the sleep window. I don't think you really need to calculate sleep efficiency. So Glynis, uh, thank you so much for these questions and um, and uh, for you Glynis and anybody else. As I mentioned, I will be gone for uh, a couple of weeks here, but I will answer comments. I may not answer emails because I always answer emails uh, like this in the video, but I will answer comments. So any comments on the on any on a video, really, I will answer those. So um, that said, let's let's move on to another question here. This is from Stacy. Uh, who uh, wrote me an initial email nine days ago and uh, and another one, kind of follow-up one, one day ago. So let's read that one. Thanks so much for answering my questions in depth on your podcast. I appreciate the encouragement. I have another question to follow on from that. When I first tried CBTI, it only took about four nights before I was sleeping much better. Bit of a fluke. Now that I'm trying it again, it's taking many nights longer and it's causing me horrible anxiety. I have generalized anxiety disorder and my biggest trigger is now how I feel with lack of sleep. After not sleeping well or enough, I wake up with horrible anxiety and fatigue and can hardly drag myself through the day. I'm so emotional, crying spells and hopeless. Sticking to a sleep window which I have set for myself, 11.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. sounds great and I say to myself, set it and forget it but if it goes on for three or four more light nights i lose my marbles how do people function on so little sleep and keep a smile on his or her face i always took pride in the fact that i slept eight to nine hours a night and i really feel that i cannot function on what i've been getting between three to six hours i know this is where acceptance and mindfulness and distraction comes in but i'm struggling thanks again sincerely stacy um Stacy, um, 
you know, thanks for emailing me. This is an important email because I think a lot of people uh, struggle the first uh, the first weeks. And I know for you, it's kind of the second time you're doing CBTI, which again, in a way, you know, that can kind of go both ways. And one on the one hand, you've used these techniques before successfully, which can kind of boost your confidence that you can do again. But on the flip side of that, you always you also have kind of a little bit of expectation and you're like it worked last time why isn't it working now which can actually work in the opposite direction as well but um i want to say that uh, a lot of people describe the first one to two weeks of like uh spending less time in bed as like hell it's like a hellish like i heard that or like it's really hard etc and um it, it you know it, i want to say this that I, I think that is because, uh, for many reasons, but one of the big ones is that there is this kind of extinction burst with insomnia. It's an extinction burst. And, and so the, 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 the example I like to use here is, imagine that you have this toddler that is always trying to get your attention uh, by, often by like screaming and like acting out, etc. cetera. And, and you decide no more. I'm just going to ignore him. Uh, so this behavior stops. Well, guess what? When you start ignoring that toddler, he's going to try even harder to get your attention. He's going to scream and kick and act out like crazy to keep your attention. And it's the same thing with insomnia. There's this part of your brain that's identifying sleeplessness as like a problem, a threat. And he wants you to solve it. He wants you to sleep more. He wants you to spend more time in bed, try more to sleep. And when you start spending less time in bed, when you try to shift your attention, think about other things, that part of your brain kind of goes on hyperdrive and goes like, no, you can't do that. You have to get more sleep. And the insomnia can get worse initially. You know, you have the insomnia, you're sleeping less, you're in hyperdrive, you're, you're super, that is the extinction burst. And when I like, when I say, why I, why I say like ex extinction burst all the time, it is because it's this burst, it's this burst of, of like, anxiety and like you know uh acting out in toddler example that happens before the extinction you know before things start getting better so you know another thing similar is that uh another way kind of describing the same thing is like i tell people that the first week first two weeks it can be longer but typically the first two weeks is like a yo-yo stage where you kind of like you may have a sleep more, but then you sleep terrible and very little and you sleep more, et cetera, et cetera. And the important thing in that yo-yo stage is to just keep going, just keep going, do not give up, just keep going. Because when you reach the, the next stage, which I call the foothold stage, where you're starting to believe, you're starting to see this is working, you're starting to have these moments where you fall back to sleep quicker, you're like, oh, this is working. If you just reach that foothold stage, then there's almost like no turning back. People who reach that, always do well so and you know I, I, as you can maybe tell here i'm not what i'm talking about right now in, in regards to this email is not very practical it's more inspirational you know because you you got it like um i know this is where acceptance and mindfulness and distraction comes in yes particularly distraction i feel particularly like finding the reserves deep within you to just do something, no matter how tired you are, try to do something that you enjoy. Oh, so, something I heard somebody say is like, kind of have a reward system for like, when you, you step very little, then do something you, you enjoy, you know, like um, whatever you enjoy in life, like try to rule. So it almost becomes a reverse thing, like sleeping less, you do something fine. Then when you can show yourself that even after sleeping almost nothing, you can have a decent day, your fear of sleepless night is reduced. And you have much less of them. And um, how do fun people function on so little sleep? Um, there is this thing called core sleep, which is like the minimum amount of sleep that is like sustainable. And it's actually, you may be surprised to hear this, uh, people can muddle through like, for a long period of time, like four hours. I think in the army, they, they, they do like these exercises when they sleep four hours because it's kind of the minimum you can muddle through. So people can, it's possible to do that. It's not recommendable. Like, you know, it's not like I tell people you should sleep four hours, not at all. But 
the, you know, just to answer that question. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I hope this is helpful, Stacy. And I want to say hang in there. And, uh, and uh, one last thing, which I say here every so often, is that I, all the people that are, are taken care of, those people who have not given up, just like found the reserves, just kept going, always do better. All right? Hang in there. Uh, okay. So that was um, Stacy and Glynis. And um, we had another question for from Vince. I think this is a, a good question, actually. So I Vince has been contributing a lot to the channel lately and asked me, and, and he said something that I've heard said before, which is like, um, CBTI, like, it's not working. Why is CBTI not working for me? Why is cognitive behavioral therapy not working for me? And when people, when I hear people say that about anything, like this medication didn't work, this thing didn't work, this didn't work, that signals to me that whoever said that was hoping that this thing, whatever it is, was going to make them sleep, make them sleep more or kind of make them sleep in general. And nothing can do that. And here, here's where confusion comes in. I always I often say CBTI works. When I mean, what I mean by that is not that it makes you sleep, but it makes you um, kind of change your behavior. It, it makes it educates you. It, it, it leads you to a place where sleep becomes much more likely, but nothing can make you sleep. And, and, and here's the thing. when you If you approach cognitive behavioral therapy as in like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do this and I'm going to sleep. Then you're creating what's called a sleep effort. You're doing something with the kind of specific direct intent of that making you sleep, which just leads to self-monitoring. So let's say you use the sleep window that we talked about earlier. This is going to make me sleep. Then you're like, okay, it's midnight. Now I'm going to sleep. No, I'm not sleeping. It's 1230. Why isn't it working? Why? Okay, I have to get up. So that, it, that is never helpful. So you have to set it and forget it. Like you, 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 you can't hope or expect that anything will make you sleep. Anything that you expect that will make you sleep will not, like that will just backfire. So I hope that it uh, helps um, uh, sort out some confusion Vince, that came out of that. Um, so uh, again, I know I get back to all, all the time to set it and forget it, but like just trying to do important to avoid making CBTI even a sleep effort. Um, now, let's go to this other email from Scott. And um, he wrote the following, actually, just four hours ago. Hi, Daniel. Been doing a little better, but I was hoping to hear back from you. I guess my main question uh, uh, below is, have you had patients find their way to healthy, normal sleeping after years of really struggling? It would be great to hear some people's stories who really have severe uh, issues recover. Um, first of all, been doing a little better. I'm super happy to hear that. Like when it comes to insomnia, you really have to like hold on to every little positive thing uh, because particularly when you have insomnia for a long time, things can feel so hopeless and like daunting and like, and, and, and you can be in that kind of dark place. And when you play up those little positives, then, you know, if, if something a little positive happens and you just play that, you write it down, you tell somebody, it becomes an affirmation. You start like, okay, a little good thing happened there. And then you may not, you may like, even if people, things go back to the way they were, you're like, but that happened, that good thing happened. Then you're like, it's kind of like climbing, like climbing up the wall and these little positive things become like the grips you hold on to. And, and those affirmations, I believe in affirmations. I think they can really help. So play those up. That is that is very good. Um, now, I want to say uh, I, I feel like I may have said this, Scott, to you. I'm sorry if I have, but this is like my favorite book when it comes to sleep by Sasha Stevens. Her story is she had she was deep in the hole, like deep on the rabbit hole for 13 years, 13 years, and she writes of how she um, ended up going to this camping trip, which she was dreading. And uh, and when she went camping that time, she she kind of like that was like a turning point for her, uh, and she um, started seeing that she could sleep and she didn't have to do all these things that she, she was trying to do to produce sleep, etc. And, and she went on to to write some great books, but that's one example of somebody who had insomnia for thirteen years that um, 
it got on to sleep much better. And another one from this channel, I'm sorry I don't know the number of this video, and if you have time, you can easily find it though, like if you just scroll through my my playlist, it's 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 uh, uh, Pixie, I think I call it like Pixie Beats 13 Years of Insomnia. And that's a viewer from our channel here that's contributed a lot under different names. It was first of Pixie, then it was like Love on the Rocks. I think yeah, he changed his name, but anyway, um, Pixie, same thing, 13 years too. Pixie had uh, insomnia for 13 years and um, went on to decide to like, okay, I'm gonna spend less time in bed and then I'm not gonna care if I sleep. I'm just gonna, I don't, I don't care. That was like his thing that um, really, uh, you know, was a turning point for him. And um, and Pexy always, when Pexy comments here, is kind of like very, kind of tough love. Like, you gotta stop thinking about sleep. There's nothing wrong with you. Your sleep drive works. Just spend less time in bed and don't think about it like that. Like, that's kind of his style of, coaching if you are helping and I can sense that you know frustration with having I think as he says himself like I, I lost 13 years to insomnia and I was like just stop thinking about it like that's kind of his style um which I think works really well for a lot of people um and I want to say something more which is um I, again the key thing here you know when you talk to somebody that has has insomnia for a long time and they get better it's they never say like, now it's gone and now I sleep eight hours and I sleep really great. It's always like, I don't, it's always like a perception change. It's always like, well, I don't really sleep much more, but I don't think so much about sleep. I stopped trying to figure out why I can't sleep. I, um, I'm not so worried about sleep anymore. I don't feel it's a problem anymore. That is success, you know? Success is often acceptance, you know, um, and and you know it maybe it's kind of disappointing to think of that think of it that way. But on the flip side, when you're kind of trying to sleep more, trying to sleep better, you just like I can't get it, I can't get it. You know, you you may feel trapped in this like endless pursuit of like trying to sleep better versus you when you go to a place of like, well, I I don't sleep great at all, but. I guess this is it, kind of acceptance. Then you can find like, but you know, I, I'm okay like that. That that I think that's a real insight for particularly for someone who's had trouble sleeping for a long time. So, I want to share that one. And um, I think I've shared this too with this talk. But look at uh, Martin Reeves, um, uh, InsomniaCoach.com, like his podcast. I think you'll find some success stories there. And and one more, the last one is uh, just recently from clinic where I work, my day job. The patient I saw like four weeks ago, deep down the hole, like did all the like the rituals, the beliefs, the supplements, like, and uh, I think I saw her in like just that right moment. She's just ready, and um, it, I just had one visit with her, like maybe forty to five minutes, like talking about like all the stuff I talk about here, and she came back like uh, a week or two ago, and uh, I think she's past her insomnia. Like she had insomnia for like 15 years. And again, like not like I sleep fantastic, but it's just like so relieved. I'm not worried about it anymore. And uh, I think she has maybe some few steps uh, left there before she's kind of completely past it, but definitely getting there. So there's hope for everyone. It's hope, there's hope for everyone. Absolutely. Um, so Scott, hang in there. Keep in, stay in touch, stay in touch. And then, and then fine, I think finally here, actually with like two comments, um, two comments I want to, to talk about. And one of them, oh, here, this was from a vitamin C. This is a comment on, what is this? A comment on, uh, sorry for this. Um, here it is. I, I want to let you know where it is. So if you want to check it out, this is a comment on, Insomnia Insight, number 43 on paradoxical insomnia. And uh, vitamin C wrote the following. Hi, I actually discovered the issue of not getting uh, REM sleep mainly arises when there is school or work the day after. It's because I sleep normally on holidays and weekends. I don't overthink school or work. Does that mean an anxiety, um, an anti-anxiety medication would help? I don't know, honestly. I think um, 
couple things here where like um I, I hear this a lot. People say like I only get REM sleep or um how can I get more REM sleep, etc. And and uh, vitamin C here says uh the issue of not getting REM sleep mainly arises when there's school or work the day after. Now, you know, my thinking when I see this is like, how do you know you it's more REM sleep? I think um, vitamin C, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you mean that, you know, when you say getting more REM sleep, you mean you get more kind of refreshing deep sleep, which may not be REM sleep at all. But uh, uh, why, am I, why am I talking about this? It's just because I feel like when people focus on REM sleep, focus on deep sleep, focus on this and that, like sleep stages, it doesn't really help. It just typically creates more kind of preoccupation with sleep and overthinking. And when you just think of it as like, I slept well or I didn't sleep well, I think that's usually actually more helpful. But anyway, what you're describing here uh, is kind of anticipatory insomnia that uh, when there's school or work the day after, you know, like tomorrow, then, um, you're not sleeping as well. Classic anticipatory insomnia. And here's the thing, like um, the way I um, I feel like uh, anticipatory insomnia is best approach is to to try to use try to find find evidence that you can sleep uh, well, uh, even if you have something going on the following day. Like find that exception where, like, oh, that one time I did have school the following day, but I slept well. That kind of proves to you that it's not always. It's not always that when you have school the following day that you're not going to sleep well or the flip side of that like find some example of when you didn't sleep well although it was a holiday and that can like prove to you that okay it doesn't have to be like that and, and that can that can help um another one with true insomnia is acceptance too that when we have something that's kind of stressful the following day it is normal not to sleep as well that's one now the question was really like so would anti-anxiety medication help me here's the thing with that is that you're right, it's it's probably some degree of anxiety that those nights make you not sleep as well. So what if you took like an anti-anxiety medication on those nights, would it kind of reduce some anxiety and help and allow you to sleep better? Very possible that maybe that could happen. I am super, super, super um, against sleep. I feel like they always end up hurting you because they hurt your sleep confidence i feel like they always lead to that place where you feel like okay I, you know i took this medication now i slept that means i need that medication to sleep and guess what then the next time like you have some kind of stress or anxiety you take the medication it doesn't work then you're like whoa it's not working that creates more anxiety then you try to up the dose or try another medication and then that doesn't work and then you go down the rabbit hole so you know uh no, no medical <laughs> medical advice here like you know uh but i'm uh, super cautious when it comes to anything uh any medication used for sleep so hope that was helpful vitamin c and with that said one more comment here which is from um from cali uh who who wrote here um uh 23 hours ago and cali had been i, I think cali is like um uh, has had has some anxiety and that kind of stuff. I, I think I think it sounds to me like she sleeps pretty good uh, for stretches of time, but when there's more anxiety, kind of insomnia and stuff. But anyway, she said, "I've definitely been sleeping a lot better." Exclamation mark, which is fantastic, awesome, super happy to hear that. Whenever I'm on breaks, it somehow makes it worse. Like I don't have much uh, much to think about schoolwork. And then sometimes I stay up late and wake up late. You screws up the cycle. Then the next night, the pressure is worse. You know how that is. Absolutely. And I think that was such a good point here. Like, oftentimes, like, she's saying, when I don't have schoolwork and I don't have much to think about, things actually become worse, which is just such an important way of highlighting how being preoccupied, being like um, having things that, we're active doing when we're not thinking about sleep that actually helps that helps so much anyway but daniel i definitely appreciate these responses i know i can sleep i just have very bad anxiety that disrupts the going to sleep what if uh i gotta wake early etc and yes you're so correct about the coping mechanism seriously i'm like wow i don't have to get up early i can sleep late i don't have to worry tonight those always help me I know it's bad, but it's definitely hard to push past that. Yeah, I could, you know, um, 
uh, the, the, the thing we feel about the coping mechanism is like uh, when somebody doesn't have any obligation, they don't, they can get up whenever they want in the morning and they have a really poor night, they sleep very little and then they kind of catch up in the morning and like, oh good, I can sleep now from eight to nine and then they went to bed. Like that is not good because it just perpetuates this cycle of like not sleeping well at night and then kind of coping by sleeping in the morning. Um, but sorry, there was, seems to be a little break there. But if on the other hand, if you're like, uh, if you're just like not, um, if you're just not stressed about tomorrow and you, and you sleep good, that I don't, that's not a problem. Uh, as long as it doesn't, you know, mess up your cycle or whatnot, but it's not a problem. Like, of course, sleeping more or better when you don't have stress, that's not a problem. However, if you don't sleep well at night and then you kind of cope by sleeping in the morning, that long, long term, definitely that is not good for, for sleep patterns, etc. And finally, the thing that scares me about when I get into bad cycle of sleep is that it scares me that I just want to go back to it being bad again because it's so bad. So that is such an important comment again. And like what Kelly's describing is like when she starts having trouble sleeping, she's afraid that it's going to become like a real like insomnia thing. And, uh, um, and, and that's like such a driver on insomnia is, is the fear of the big one. Like when you've had like some, a stretch of really bad sleep and, and then like years later on, it's almost like PTSD. You can be afraid of that coming back. But I really believe that, um, you, you know, one thing is like very often it doesn't, it's rare. It's often like people fear the big one coming back, but the big one rarely does come back. It's, it's more, but again, it's the fear of the big one that's driving insomnia. So I think as long as you like, when you, when you go into a period where you're like not sleeping as much, as long as you just keep, you know, keep doing what you're doing, keep distracted, keep try to find the reserves, do what you're doing. Don't spend more time in bed. Don't start chasing sleep. Don't start trying supplements. Don't try, don't react. You will not have it's better again just like they did for you Kelly and they have done in the past so um with all this said um I will again um will again be I'll be gone for a few weeks uh, my connection seems to be unstable but hopefully I can just say that I'll be gone for a few weeks thank you so much for this year 2019 has been great I've been, uh, been so happy with every email every comment every interaction with with anybody out there and i will be back 2020 until then take it easy